if you had booted up the Crypto Voice module just a month ago, this is what you would have seen and been able to do. You could adjust the headset volume. You could adjust the radio volume. And you could save. And here's what you're able to do now. Go secure and rotate. Radio check. You had tried to interact with the Crypto Voice module a month ago. This is what you would have been able to do. And this is what you're able to do now. Key select. Go secure and rotate. Secure. Key select. One. Two. Two selected. Radio check. And as a little bonus, key load. Ready to load. Loaded. Key one selected. Even having done all the work myself, I'm amazed how quickly it all came together. There's a lot of functionality to go over, but I'll try not to take too long. I'm deliberately skipping very basic configuration like assigning audio devices and configuring headset and radio volume, which has been covered in other videos in my build instructions document. I'll put a link to that in the description. This video is intended to show more recent and advanced features so you can get the most out of your crypto voice modules when deploying them, and to give you an idea of what I was thinking of when I designed the platform. There are two many main hardware configurations the system is designed for, with screen and without screen. Unfortunately, for those of you who plan to go without screen, the initial setup does require one. But once you've done that and saved your settings, the system is designed to never need one. Dedicated buttons and key combinations let you do normal tasks. Then in addition to those two main hardware configurations, there are two modes a device can operate in, unlocked mode and locked mode. An unlocked device has the ability to make changes to system configuration. A locked device doesn't. An unlocked device also has the ability to deploy one or more locked devices. I'll talk about that in more detail later. Out of the box, the system is unlocked and runs in a continuous transmit mode with push to talk disabled. I do this because it makes it easy for someone who's just built their rig to check if it works. But the first thing I recommend is to enable push to talk. To do that, go to configuration options, Configure hardware, configure PTT GPIO, enable PTT, and we'll turn that on. And I'll put a diagram up of what the uh, default pin assignments are. All inputs are by default active low with the built-in pull-up resistor enabled. All outputs are by default active low open drain. Push to talk is the only IO that you need to explicitly turn on. For the rest, if you hook up an input, the system can use it. As I showed in my demonstration, push to talk can be configured to be activated from the console interface instead of through the, G the Pi GPIO header. To do this, go to Configure Input GPIO Pin and select Console Interface. When this is activated, you will see an additional Transmit Voice option in the main menu. I strongly recommend unlocked devices set a password to access the configuration menu as it reduces the risk of unauthorized key duplication. Steps should also be put in place to limit physical access to unlocked devices with keys loaded, as well as the amount of time a device remains unlocked. I'll talk about that in more detail later. To set a configuration password, go to set configuration menu password and type your password and it will ask for you to type it a second time and make sure that the passwords match. Do note that the password hash is saved to the SD card, so steps should be taken to reduce the risk of tampering. However, configuration data is only read from the SD card once during system startup, so the device would need to be power cycled for any modifications to the SD card to take effect. 
The system has the ability to broadcast text-to-speech alerts, either through the console interface or through button presses on the keypad. When activated, the system will activate the radio push-to-talk and disable the microphone for the duration of the broadcast. The alert is also play played back to the operator over the headset as a confirmation that the correct alert is being broadcast. These alerts are limited to 160 characters in length and can be useful to quickly signal a short message either for the sake of efficiency or if you are unable to speak. The system lets you save two preset messages and the console interface also lets you broadcast custom ones. To configure these, go to Configure TTS Alert Broadcasts and then select either the primary or secondary alert. So let's configure those real quick. And we have the radio mode, which is accessible here. This is going to heavily depend on what type of radio you have and where you plan to use it. The system supports multiple HF modes as well as the original narrowband FM mode. I'm just going to keep it at default for now. Now we can go hit Save Configuration to SD card, and the hardware and radio configuration is saved. This does not save keys nor can keys be saved to an unlocked device SD card. Now let's talk about keys. Since we are using commodity hardware, we are subject to its limitations, and one of those limitations is secure erasure of SD cards and USB drives. It's simply not possible to guarantee that if the operating system erases data from the card or drive, that the data still doesn't reside on it somewhere. So when out in the field, it's recommended that either you not have a card or drive with keys on it, you have a way of quickly destroying it, or you have a card or drive that does guarantee secure erasure. If destruction or secure erasure in the field is an option, then really any key management solution is available to you. But if it isn't, then here are the two configurations I had in mind when designing the system. The first configuration is to create an all-in-one locked device SD card containing firmware configuration and keys on it. Boot all devices with that one card, then destroy it. If power is disconnected from the device, both the keys and the firmware are securely erased from device memory, and the device is rendered inoperable. This method gives you both security and deniability, as it is very hard to determine what a Pi without an SD card is supposed to do. The second configuration is to create one locked SD card per device containing firmware and configuration but not keys, and then one SD card or USB drive containing just keys. Once a locked device is booted up using that firmware card, keys can be loaded from the second card or drive, and that card or drive containing keys can be destroyed. If power is disconnected from the device, the keys are erased from device memory, but when power is reconnected, the device can continue to function in an insecure mode. This method gives you security, but not necessarily deniability, as someone with the SD card will be able to know the intended function of the device. Regarding key storage, 128 megabyte micro SD cards can be purchased in bulk at a dollar each. 128 megabyte USB drives go for slightly more. Storing cards and drives isn't infeasibly expensive. There are also some interesting commercial options for secure USB drives with built-in keypads or Bluetooth connectivity for pin entry. I've never used any, so can't vouch for them or their security, and reading up on them, some models appear to have a questionable security record, but they may be worth considering for their secure wipe function. Something I'm amazed doesn't seem to exist is a small USB drive that uses DRAM instead of flash and is powered off coin cell battery, as it would be perfect for this. The security of this approach obviously depends on the locked devices staying locked. This assumes two things. One is that I implemented the functionality correctly in the code. I hope I did, but it's all open source, so you can always double check. The other is that the SD card with the configuration on it hasn't been tampered with because whether or not a device is locked depends on configuration stored on the SD card. Someone in theory could modify it. There's a somewhat obscure feature on micro SD cards called Permanent Write Protect, which does what it says. You set that flag, and the SD card prevents changes being made to the card. So when the software creates locked device SD cards, it sets that flag once it's done. Of course, you have to trust that, that the SD card vendor is implementing that correctly, and I recommend you verify this. And it probably doesn't prevent physical tampering of the SD card, but it would require more skill and effort to tamper with the card. You could probably mitigate this risk somewhat by encasing the SD card in epoxy. I'll briefly demonstrate this. This card is just temporarily locked because it's my development card, 
But if I list the contents, you can see that it has a firmware image on it. And I'll try to overwrite it with random data, which normally would completely trash it. But if I list the contents again, you can see all the data is still there. But you also note that the operating system didn't report any errors. So if you check this, keep in mind the OS may actually think it's still able to write to the card, even if it can't. So let's go to the device to walk through the workflow for the two options. For that, we'll go to our unlocked base station. Here we have the base station model with a basic commodity LCD connected and running off the same battery pack as the Pi. It's only 800 by 480, but that's more than enough. I have a keyboard connected, but the software is designed to work with a numpad as well. When a numpad is connected, use the asterisk button to select items from a list instead of spacebar. As what was originally the configuration utility grew in complexity, it occurred to me that it could serve as the user interface for larger models requiring a screen. The idea was that these base stations would have an identical hardware configuration as the handheld units, except for the addition of a screen and keyboard or numpad. When run running in unlocked mode, it could be used to configure a number of locked devices and a standard set of keys prior to their deployment, as I'm going to show now. Upon deployment, it could be loaded with a locked base station or a handheld card. Let's generate some keys. Go to Configuration Options, Configure Encryption, Generate Encryption Keys, and we'll generate, say, eight keys. And put them in the first eight slots. Now, where to save the keys? I have two blank SD cards and one blank USB drive here. If we go to Deploy Images, Screen, we see several options. We have options for locked devices with and without keys, and for just keys. For the first configuration where everything is loaded into memory and the SD card is removed prior to, to deployment, we'll select locked handheld with keys. And that will take the firmware configuration and keys we set up earlier and write it all to this SD card and then make that card read only. For the second configuration, where the device is configured with just the firmware and configuration on the SD card, we'll first select locked handheld with no keys. And we'll go through the uh, same process here, except it won't install the keys. Then we'll take our USB drive and select just keys, which will just load the keys on the drive. We could also do this with an SD card, but I'm going to mix that up a bit. And just to show real quick what I mean by locked, this is what it looks like once a locked handheld device is booted up. The user is completely locked out of the console and can't get out of the screen. Now let's move over to the handheld unit. This is the handheld model without screen. The I.O. header is fully populated, but buttons couldn't be omitted. These buttons and LEDs are made to plug into a PC motherboard, and they work fine here. You have push-talk input. This LED is wired to push-talk output. Then we have the volume buttons the alert and key rotate and load buttons, and the plain secure toggle button. And this red LED is a status indicator, which is on whenever the Pi is powered on with a bootable firmware image in the SD card. Push to talk is straightforward. The output is computer controlled to apply dead key to account for delays caused by the system and voice codec. The status output was intended to work with a pass-through relay system. Under normal operating conditions, the open drain signal could be used to power relays, routing headset, and push to talk to the device. If the device were rendered inoperable, the rel relay system could route these signals directly to the radio. The volume buttons 
We'll raise or lower the headset volume by increments and emit a beep when doing so. The plain secure button will toggle between plain analog transmissions and secure transmissions. You will hear a text-to-speech notification and a confirmation chime. Secure. The text-to-speech tells you that the mode was changed, and the chime tells you that the change was successfully applied to the system. If you ever hear this chime, Plain. your transmissions are not secure, even if the text-to-speech notification says they are. The alert buttons are multi-function buttons. A triple press of either will broadcast the primary or secondary alert depending on the button. Key select. Go secure and rotate. You see that the push to talk LED is activated as the system takes control of it to broadcast the alert. A press and hold of the primary alert button will activate the key select function. Key select. With the primary button held down, Press and hold the secondary button to hear the key slot currently in use. One. Release the secondary button to rotate to the next key. Press and hold the secondary button again to hear the selected key slot. Two. Repeat this pre press and release process as needed to rotate keys. Three. Release the primary button while the secondary button is held down to apply the change. Three selected. Release the primary button while the secondary button is released to cancel. Key select. Three. A press and hold of the secondary alert button will activate the key load function. This function is extremely limited to reduce the risk of misuse. If there are no keys currently loaded into the device, and an SD card or USB drive with keys is loaded into the device, it will load all keys from the card or drive and set the key index to the first slot with a key loaded into it. With the secondary button held down, press and hold the primary button. Key load. Ready to load. If the conditions just stated are met, a message will indicate the device is ready to load keys. If the conditions just stated are not met, a message will indicate that keys cannot be loaded. Release the secondary button while the primary button is held down to load keys and reset the key index. Loaded. Key one selected. Release the secondary button while the primary button is released to cancel. Now remove the drive or card with the keys. Key zero eyes is accomplished by disconnecting power to the device. If a device SD card is installed, when the system powers back on, it can still function in an insecure mode. I hope this has been informative. I've struggled with balancing some users' need to experiment with the platform with other users' need to have a secure platform, all while maintaining one code base. After all, I'm just one guy working on this thing, so I want it to be simple. But with the unlo unlocked locked distinction, I feel like I'm on the right track. And having the flashing tool built into the software makes it easier for users, too, since they don't need to use a separate utility to flash the cards. But I'm curious what you think. <laughs>